All right, everyone, thanks you for coming. Um, we have today uh, a very special guest, uh, Professor Lawrence Helfer uh, from Duke Law School. Um, he's uh, a, a widely published author who um, is, is an expert on uh, international human rights law um, and uh, recently published a piece in the American Journal of International Law, of which he's the editor in chief, uh, on derogations in human rights uh, regimes during COVID 19. Um, and he's here to talk to us today. Uh, he's, he's currently the Harry Chadwick Professor of Law at Duke uh, Law School uh, and has taught at a number of other institutions. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor, Professor Halper. Great. Thank you, Richard. And thanks everybody for um, taking the time to learn a little bit about uh, human rights treaty derogations. I'm not going to assume that anyone has any prior knowledge uh, of uh, what human rights treaty derogations are, I can explain them pretty briefly and uh, talk about uh, the genesis uh, for this paper and how it intersects with some of the other research that I've been doing recently. Uh, as Richard indicated, one of the areas of expertise that I have is international human rights law and international human rights institutions. So I've written about issues relating to, to the populist backlash against human rights, international courts and adjudication, especially the UN treaty bodies and uh, the regional human rights courts with a focus on uh, all of the three regions in Africa, the Americas and Europe. And I've also have a, a separate line of research which kind of intersects with uh, my work on human rights treaty derogations relating to the, uh, what you might call the, the flexibility provisions of all kinds of international treaties, including human rights treaties. So provisions that allow for exceptions or limitations, or in this case, derogations or the possibility of withdrawal and how those kinds of flexibility mechanisms help states to manage the risks of international agreement and also to get the most out of the most benefits out of, the, of the, their joining these treaties. And for those of you who have had any exposure to international law, you'll know that one of the challenges of the international legal system is the, um, I think it's fair to say, uneven level of um, enforcement mechanisms that exist, and they range quite a bit. Uh, there are some systems that have uh, international courts and treaty bodies, others uh, that don't. And so uh, the kinds of issues that arise with respect to encouraging states to join treaties and also comply with them intersect with making treaties kind of incentive compatible for compliance. And so that uh, relates to the kind of flexibility clauses that allow states to manage the risks of international agreement and, and derogations of one of those. So those are the two ways in which the, um, the paper that uh, I recently published in the American Journal intersects with uh, uh, what I've been doing more broadly. Um, so what I'm gonna do is kind of lay out a little bit about what derogations are uh, how derogations have been used during the last year in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, because they've they certainly had a real prominence uh, in, in the last year or so. Uh, and then I wanna use that as a springboard for thinking about some of the problems of the existing system. These are problems that predate COVID, um, but I think they've been brought to the fore and made much more uh, acute as a result of state practice with respect to treaty derogations or the lack thereof, as I'll explain uh, in, in a moment. And so then I'll, I'll conclude by, uh, my paper concludes and I'll conclude my uh, talk with um, a range of potential reform proposals in, in five different areas, what I call embeddedness, engagement, information, timing, and scope. And I'll say a word about each of those uh, briefly. I'll talk for about 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, and then I'm, I hope we can just uh, open up to Q&A uh, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have um, about uh, the paper or about this area of, um, of international law more generally. Okay, so derogations are kind of a, I guess you could call them a term of art in uh, international human rights law. Uh, and they are one of several different mechanisms by which states can limit the rights and freedoms that they have previously uh, formally agreed to uphold. Uh, and the way they work essentially is that uh, they are designed to deal with a particular kind of situation. They're designed to deal with uh, 
a crisis or emergency situation uh, and examples where the, they've been invoked include things like uh, transnational terrorist threats, war, uh, natural disasters, uh, civil unrest, uh, and now, of course, the, the global pandemic. So the idea is that states face uh, pressure uh, during emergencies to take uh, exigent, to deal with exigent situations uh, in a variety of ways. And some of those ways may require limiting or suspending rights for a particular period of time. And the drafters of the three or three of the principal civil and political rights treaties, and they're really only three major treaties that have uh, functioning derogation clauses. I should say that at the outset, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which the US is a party, the American Convention on Human Rights, to which the US is a signatory, but has never been a party, and the European Human Rights Convention. So those three, which are among the most well-known and influential uh, international treaties in the civil and political rights area, all have derogation clauses. And these clauses were put in place um, for um, a number of reasons. So first of all, uh, when these treaties were being drafted, and they, when they were being drafted, um, it was a little unclear the extent to which treaties would apply during times of war or um, other uh, domestic emergencies. And so the thought was, okay, let's put these clauses in the treaty because we want to ensure that uh, human rights remain protected even as we give some states the ability to respond to the crises that they may be facing. So that was one reason. Uh, a second reason was to try to backstop domestic institutions, especially domestic courts, to deal with the review of emergency measures that um, were put in place by the political branches, by the executive and or the legislature. And the concern of the drafters of the three treaties that I mentioned was that domestic institutions would not be uh, very robust in their review of those emergency measures. So it's quite true, and this has been documented by many other scholars, that uh, uh, during uh, these kinds of uh, uh, emergencies, uh, that uh, judges are often quite reluctant to second to guess political actors. Uh, that changes over time. So the longer you get from the initial emergency, the more judges are willing to uh, potentially intervene. But the concern was that they would not be a robust enough check on uh, emergency decrees that limited rights. Uh, and the third um, kind of rationale for why these clauses exist in, in human rights treaties was the idea that uh, states should be given some leeway to limit or suspend rights during emergencies, but, but not unlimited at all. Um, so rather, uh, there has to be a really quite serious threat that uh, the language in the treaties are threaten the life of the nation uh, that has to be officially proclaimed. And uh, the response to that is that certain rights in the treaty can be derogated from to the extent they are strictly necessary by virtue of the emergency scenario that, uh, that is prompting the restriction of rights. But a bunch of different rights, the so-called non-derogable rights. For those of you who know international law, these are peremptory norms or use kogans, uh, things like uh, slavery, torture, the right to life, uh, those kind of paramount uh, uh, human rights in the civil and political rights context, they're non-derogable. Uh, and so as a result, the state has some flexibility, but uh, they, they are constrained in other respects. And finally, the treaties put in place a system of uh, notification and monitoring. So if you're going to derogate from the treaty, you have to go through a certain set of formal procedures and send an official notification to the treaty depository, which in the UN is the UN Secretary General, uh, the, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe uh, in, in Europe, the uh, head of the Organization of American States in the Americas. And you have to say, okay, we're derogating for this particular time for these reasons from this set of rights. Uh, and uh, we're letting you know that we're doing that. And that then that derogation can, has uh, that notification I should say has, has two different consequences. So first um, it's an official public statement about the rationales for the emergency rights restrictions, uh, how long they're going to last and uh, why uh, they're, they're justified in a particular circumstance. And so they provide a kind of template where the government, uh, so to speak, 
gets to exercise what you might think of as a kind of safety valve, but only by putting its credibility on the line so that uh, voters, interest groups, domestic judges, uh, civil society groups within the country can say, well, you said the, the derogation is going to last three months and now it's six months, or you said that you would uh, try to dial back restrictions as conditions changed, you haven't done that. So that allows those uh, actors to bring political as well as in some cases legal pressure on the government to adhere to its word. So it, it kind of forces these uh, emergency rights suspensions out into the open. Uh, and allows for this uh, kind of review and monitoring. Also, the second component of that is that the international courts and treaty bodies can uh, review the legality of derogations. And they have, and there's quite a bit of international jurisprudence on derogations. And by the way, quite a bit of domestic jurisprudence in a number of countries where treaties are given a direct effect or, or uh, as we would say in the United States, are, are self-executing. So that's the rationale for these clauses. And uh, I should say at the outset that there, there's a bit of a paradox if you think about derogations from a uh, normative uh, perspective. So from, from one perspective, you have a situation where, um, as I mentioned earlier, you want states will want to have some kind of some kind of escape valve in certain circumstances when the pressure for rights violations is, is very intense. Uh, so in, they satisfy that. And you might even say that states knowing that they have that escape option or that safety valve, they might be more likely to join a treaty knowing that they'll have some flexibility uh, toward once they're a party. But at the same time, experience has shown that really grave violations of human rights occur during emergencies. Um, and so derogation clauses by at least partially condoning uh, violations during a, a crisis, in some ways you could say threaten to, to undermine the raison d'etre of, of human rights law. So that's, that's a bit of a paradox. And the way that I see that paradox being resolved, there are different views on this, but the way I see it being resolved is um, that it is that kind of uh, uh, information forcing uh, and monitoring and credibility enhancing functions that make derogations work in, in a fundamental way. And that's because during crises, states are often preoccupied with many other things. They might be worried about the political costs of suspending rights, or maybe the domestic constitutional law constraints that they face. They're really probably not thinking about international law very closely uh, in many countries. And I'll say more about why that is a little bit later. So, as a result of that, um, they're, they're much more likely if they're worried about some kind of international monitoring, they're much more likely to uh, uh, restrict or limit rights during emergencies uh, surreptitiously, right? Why advertise the fact that you would be limiting rights if that's going to be unpopular and potentially uh, legally uh, consequential? So what derogations do is they say, you have some breathing space, you have some flexibility, but it's limited and you can only get that flexibility, you only get that, that um, uh, uh, safety valve, you can only exercise it if in fact you adhere to the rules that are there, which are going to then constrain you later if there's a desire to make an emergency um, more longstanding, even potentially permanent, or to expand it over time or to use it to repress political uh, op opponents or, or opposition political parties and so forth. So that's the rationale with that in the absence of a derogation clause, you wouldn't have perfect compliance, you'd have even worse compliance and you'd have a much harder time actually finding out what states were doing vis-a-vis -vis rights during emergencies. So that's, that's I think, the, gives you a sense of what these clauses do. So what's been happening uh, during COVID? So on the, on the one hand during COVID, the, there's been a real, um, you can say this has been a kind of a heyday in some ways for um, uh, derogation, right? And some scholars have called the COVID-19 pandemic a kind of an ideal state of emergency, precisely the sort of thing that, uh, that the derogation system was designed to deal with. And in fact, uh, 30 countries have actually derogated in one form uh, or another from their uh, human rights obligations for a period of time usually three months, occasionally six months, sometimes renewed in order to deal with uh, the structures of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And interestingly, the rights that tend to be limited as a result of that are freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, and freedom of association, the very things that you know, are, would be associated with lockdowns and, and uh, restrictions uh, relating to uh, combating the pandemic. So seen from that perspective, the system seems to be you know, working pretty well, right? Because you've got a, quite a lot of states that are actually notifying and they're doing a pretty good job about uh, explaining uh, the, the laws that allow them to uh, suspend rights, uh, saying how long they'll remain in effect. Some states have already lifted, at least uh, during say periods when the pandemic has ebbed a bit, um, they have uh, lifted those suspensions. And so from that perspective, it seems like things are going well. But in reality, uh, I think it's a little more of a, a, a mixed uh, picture here. So there's far more countries that have uh, suspended rights using emergency decrees than have uh, actually derogated from human rights treaties. And that's surprising if you think about it because countries are facing quite similar public health threats, um, maybe not exactly in the exact same time frame, but COVID is a global phenomenon and, and that's you know, essentially uh, hitting countries in, in very similar ways. And yet countries have, even countries that are just uh, next door to each other have very different, um, very different uh, responses to the pandemic. So they range from very limited and tailored restrictions of rights at the one end, all the way over to the use of COVID as a pretext for very broad emergency powers that roll back a very uh, a large array of fundamental rights. Um, and so what we are seeing is uh, a very significant problem for international human rights protection during the pandemic, uh, but, it's a, but it's a concern that goes well beyond derogations. So the derogations are, are partially doing some work in the sense that they're limiting the suspensions of rights in, 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 uh, in some countries uh, in certain ways but they don't seem to be deterring some of the worst abuses and some countries seem to be staying out of the system altogether. And so for some scholars, the, the, their puzzle is, well, why aren't states using this mechanism, right? I mean, it's, a, it's essentially, it's not quite a get out of jail free card, but it, it, it does allow for uh, some uh, formal uh, uh, limitation on rights in a way that actually you would think that states would want to use. So from that perspective, um, the, the, the use of uh, derogations in response to COVID is, is in fact somewhat of a, of a puzzle. Um, but it also raises a number of issues relating to broader concerns about the system overall. And I wanted to uh, turn to those and um, talk a little bit about some of the ways in which the current system as it's designed has uh, a number of um, problems for the incentives that uh, states face. So I'll talk uh, about two kinds um, uh, of problems in this regard. One are problems that are internal to the design and operation of derogations, or you might call them the derogations regime, right? There are a number of different aspects there. And then the second potential set of problems relate to uh, developments outside of uh, international, uh, uh, of derogations in international law and international human rights law more, more generally. So um, a couple of problems about um, within uh, the system, and I wanna just highlight three. Um, and I think the one that hasn't really been given very much, and scholars have noted some of these problems for a long time. I'm not the first one to note them by any means. Uh, there have been discussions about the derogation system going back 40, 50 years. Um, but one of the things that I think hasn't really been given enough uh, focus concerns uh, the fact that there isn't any kind of linkage between uh, the domestic procedures and mechanisms for suspending rights during an emergency and international rights suspensions. And I think that's um, uh, a significant, a significant uh, concern because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, government officials are very likely going to be focusing on what uh, is domestically, politically, and legally salient and, and less concerned with their obligations uh, under international law. And the result of that um, is that 
uh, when some states don't derogate at all, um, and we don't even know that they, in many instances, we don't know they even thought about it. They could have, but didn't. We we have some very few instances where states kind of even had a debate and said, no, we're not going to we're not going to do that. They simply don't. It doesn't occur to them. Um, and as a result, when states do derogate, they often do it um, late not in advance of the emergency procedures and maybe not right afterward, sometimes weeks or months later. Uh, and the information they provide is uh, usually quite limited. So in the early days of derogations, which started, the earliest derogations were in the European human rights system involving the uh, troubles in Northern Ireland and also uh, the repression uh, of the Kurdish minority in southeast, Southeastern Turkey. Um, there were very, was very little information provided to uh, the treaty depositories. Remember, they have to disclose these, these mechanisms. So that was, um, it, things are a bit better now. So if you can actually track online, you, uh, and in my paper, there are links to all of the different uh, derogations notices. There's a formal diplomatic statement that's filed. And you can see uh, what Paraguay's emergency law is and what sort of provisions it allows in terms of suspending rights. Uh, you can see that for Nepal, you can see that for, you, you name it, right? So most of the derogations notices say, well, here's the law we're invoking. Uh, here are the rights we're going to suspend. Here's why we're going to suspend them. And here's how long the suspensions are going to remain in effect. Now, having said that, that, that probably overstates how much information states are providing. They probably are providing a little bit less than that. And they're especially weak on the rationales. And um, they are... Uh, much more likely to say that any justification they think is acceptable under their domestic legal regime, constitutionally or in a statutory um, uh, set of statutory rules, that's enough to satisfy international law. Um, but in reality, that's, that's not true, right? So the international law has its own set of limitations and restrictions, some of which I mentioned um, at the beginning of my talk. So um, how does that get states um, in some sort of trouble if they do in fact derogate. Well, that is a concern because over time, those uh, countries that have derogated have had their right suspensions during emergencies reviewed by the uh, regional courts, the European and Inter-American Courts of Human Rights and by the UN Human Rights Committee, the treaty body that uh, is the supervisory body for the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And so the, those bodies have developed quite a bit of case law. And the case law is interesting in the sense that it's rather bifurcated. So what do I mean by that? So on the one hand, the tribunals have said, and I think this is entirely right, uh, we're not in as good a position to uh, determine whether an emergency situation exists, uh, the kinds of measures that need to be taken to respond to that emergency, and how long the emergency should remain in effect. So the tribunals tend to be quite deferential, uh, or to use the lingo of the European human rights system, give a broad margin of appreciation or margin of discretion to uh, government officials during emergencies. On the other hand, however, the treaties give, uh, because of the language in the treaties that require uh, uh, limitations on uh, protected rights and freedoms to be strictly uh, necessary or strictly required by the exigencies of the situation, the tribunals have said, well, um, we're going to look at necessity, we're going to look at proportionality, and we're going to determine, we may determine that actually you went too far. Um, and thus, your restriction violated your treaty obligations, violated international law. And so, from that perspective, states that thought they were functioning within the system and staying within its limits actually later find out that uh, once their laws are challenged that there's that they in fact by that it didn't work right and that the message from that might be to say um, well why do we have why will we do this again right if we're going to be having uh, the publicity and the notification in some cases uh, legal uh, uh, sanctions or legal consequences of uh, derogating and doing so contrary to what the treaties require. Um, so those are again, the three points within the system, no linkage to domestic uh, institutions, uh, insufficient uh, 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 information in, in the notices and timing problems uh, as to when notices of derogation are filed, uh, 
And then uh, the review by international tribunals that tends to lead to a finding of violations when the tribunals, um, sometimes, by the way, I should say, it could be three, four, five, seven years later, review, often with the benefit of hindsight, whether the restrictions the government adopted were necessary. So those three different developments within the derogation system are some of the problems that, that have exacerbated the incentives that states face not, not to derogate. I wanna mention um, a, a num three problems now outside of the system, and then I'll turn to the potential, uh, just a brief note about some of the potential reforms that, that I'm proposing and, and then we'll conclude. Um, so there, there are three developments outside the system that I think are worth um, talking about. So uh, the first relates to the fact that um, there are many more uh, human rights agreements than the three that I've been talking about. And some, depending on how you count, 80, 90 or so. And the vast majority of these uh, human rights treaties do not contain derogation clauses at all. Right, so they they and that might seem to be well. Maybe they're not necessary anymore. Maybe what was needed in treaties negotiated uh, adopted in the 1950s or 60s uh, is necessary for treaties adopted in the 80s, 90s, and aughts, and, and so forth. So that's a a, a kind of um, uh, progressive development of international law story, and I think there's there's some truth to that. Um, that we see the, the the many treaties not having these these clauses. Um, but what I think often gets um, somewhat ignored in, in that regard is the fact that the derogations clauses themselves contain what is sometimes uh, referred to uh, as a savings clause. And one of the limitations, I mentioned a number of limitations previously, one I didn't mention was that uh, a derogation is not uh, lawful uh, if it is inconsistent with the state's other obligations under international law. More specifically, that would be other human rights treaties that is recognized. And in that scenario, if as a result of that savings clause, or you might call kind of a, a, a linkage, in, a indirect linkage mechanism, um, you have situations where a state that actually goes through all the motions of derogating uh, from one of the treaties that contains the derogations clause is still going to be on the hook for that uh, legal responsibility uh, under another treaty. So I'll give you one concrete example that relates to, to COVID. So you may know, already know that there have been lots of studies on this, that domestic violence has increased markedly uh, during the COVID pandemic um, as people are locked up at home and tense and all the other reasons that you can obviously imagine. So. Um, at the same time, you could imagine, at least during the height of the lockdown, that states might say, look, our ability to um, take action with respect to the, uh, the, that domestic violence might be uh, more limited in the context of a pandemic when we're not able to uh, investigate in the same way, go into the home in the same way, at least during the early days of the pandemic. You can imagine a state saying this. And, and limiting uh, the, the right to privacy or family life, which can be uh, derogated from under the three treaties that I mentioned. So if you assume for purposes of argument that some sort of uh, limited derogation from the right of privacy and family life would be okay, uh, it's not okay under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Convention, because that convention does not have a derogations clause and its obligations continue in uh, full force. So from that perspective, you could imagine a state might say, well, why would I bother derogating if I can derogate from Treaty A, but the same conduct or maybe even broader uh, conduct is required under Treaty B, I'm not going to bother. Right? So, so that's one concern that again uh, affects the incentives to derogate and to be subject to the kind of information disclosure and monitoring that that system creates. Um, the two other developments are, I think, a kind of unintended consequence of the way in which international human rights law has expanded over time. So uh, the international courts and review bodies that I've mentioned have substantially expanded treaties, uh, the, the scope of obligations in treaties, including those treaties that don't contain uh, uh, derogations clauses. 
And they've done that in a way that I think has made it more challenging for states during uh, times of uh, emergency. So for example, the, the example I discussed in the paper is the uh, Convention on Economic, Social and, and Cultural Rights, which has been interpreted by the treaty body that supervises that uh, convention as essentially saying that what a core obligations with respect to um, the rights to food, to water, to housing and health, those are non-derogable and continue to exist uh, during uh, times of armed conflict or emergencies or national, natural disasters. So in a situation like that, you have uh, a treaty that has no derogation clause, but has been interpreted even more capaciously. And, and a, as a result, uh, creating uh, disincentives or, or for states to comply or to use uh, the derogations provisions of, of, of other treaties. Um, the third and final development relates to um, how these same international tribunals have interpreted non-derogable rights. And I discuss in the paper how in all three of the treaty systems, the right to life has been expansively interpreted as including a range of uh, positive obligations as well as negative obligations. So the classic uh, in incarnation of the right to life courses in the, in the death penalty context, in uh, police uh, violence context, um, things like that. But now uh, by interpretation to include as well things uh, like uh, food, shelter, healthcare, electricity, sanitation as all part of the right to life, which remember is non-derogable. So that sort of interpretation substantially uh, enlarges the scope and reach of international human rights law that applies during emergencies. And that's not a bad thing, of course, but without, however, concomitantly enlarging the authority of states to suspend rights during those crises. So again, you have more legal obligations, but not the flexibility mechanisms that uh, went along with uh, some of the obligations when they were initially drafted. So with that said, let me just conclude with a couple of words about some of the potential. I think you can probably guess what some of the reforms are. They're, they're linked to some of the problems that I've identified. So as a reminder, I had said there were five different areas of reform that I identify, embeddedness, engagement, information, timing, and scope. And I'll just say a little about each of them and then of course take questions. So um, in terms of embeddedness, I think one of the, the key things that really could be done that would be really quite positive would be to um, link the domestic and international systems in a way that would uh, or states to at least consider the possibility of derogating uh, when an emergency arises. So as it is now, I was only able to find, I think one country where the constitutional provision during emergencies requires the state to derogate. Um, there may be some others in statutory law, but I'm, I'm not aware of them. Uh, and rather these two, uh, sets of legal rules during uh, regulating emergency rights limitations proceed on kind of separate tracks. And I think one easy way to remedy that problem would be to, to give states discretion to decide how they want to domesticate or implement this obligation to, to derogate if they're going to actually spend rights, uh, but that they need to do it in some way. So, um, that could be an emergency powers chapter of a constitution and the statute that uh, specifies limits on uh, individual liberty restrictions during emergencies or administrative regulations of say a foreign ministry. Um, any of that would, uh, would be really helpful and at least would uh, give, uh, require the state to think about whether it wanted to derogate. And that would actually uh, make it, I think more likely that states would use this mechanism and thus that the that, that use would be subject to the information disclosure and monitoring um, that comes along with it, both domestically and internationally. Uh, the second reform uh, is in the area of engagement. And here I think uh, one of the problems is that when a state does derogate, the response of at least the treaty depositories is largely to view this as kind of a box checking exercise. Oh, here's the notice. All we have to do is circulate it to the treaty parties and maybe to the relevant tribunal and we're done, right? We're not gonna actually um, 
uh, take any action to try to find out from the state, hey, is it really necessary for you to derogate? Um, and uh, if so, uh, what are you thinking of doing? Maybe we can share some information about what other states are doing in this context that might you might find useful and that might cause you to narrow the restrictions you're taking. So the treaty depositories can can serve a, a can provide a much more I think uh, informal consultative role. And indeed, in Europe, there have been proposals along these lines uh, for for the the Secretary General of the Council of Europe to do just that. And I think formalizing that process and setting up a a set of best practices with respect to it would be really would be really useful. Um, third, information. So obviously, I've talked about a number of information shortcomings in the, the derogations regime. Uh, I think that, that those can be uh, bolstered. You can imagine having a set of guidelines for countries about precisely what information they should include. There are some guidelines that are out there, although they're a bit they're a bit out of date, and they could be they could be updated. Uh, and so that's one. Uh, I think it would also be extremely useful to uh, have states do something to notify uh, information that they don't notify now. So for example, which domestic institution, court, legislative committee, what have you, is going to be authorized to review those emergency measures and when those evaluations are likely to occur. So in other words, uh, it's very hard for other states' parties or for a treaty depository to know what's going on in it can be as high as you know 100 and you know 94 states right, where the number of UN member states are for some for some of these treaties a very high membership others you know are somewhat lower but even then to know which domestic institution is going to be empowered to do this is something that it can be difficult to find out um, in in certainly in some legal systems uh, so disclosing when that kind of review is going to happen how it's going to happen what institutions are there also helps to bolster the information and monitoring function of, of derogations. And I think that would be very useful, along with the treaty bodies publicizing when right suspensions end. So for example, in the COVID pandemic, a number of countries really did stick to the three month limit that they said they would set for the initial derogation. Uh, and uh, other countries have just automatically, it seems kind of renewed their derogation for another three months and then another three months. So what has Azerbaijan done right or wrong that you know that can learn from what Mongolia has done right or wrong, right? So you can imagine that that kind of information could be really could be really useful. Um, uh, in terms of the fourth uh, and penultimate um, reform uh, questions of, of timing, there are a number of issues here, but the one I'll just focus on is this very long delay between the actual derogation and the review of it by an international court or, or treaty body. And I think there are um, a number of ways that one could um, uh, deal with that kind of issue. And that could be expediting uh, uh, certain kinds of claims, could even be a kind of advisory opinion from the treaty depository to the international court to say, is this derogation okay? Uh, or it could be under the various uh, expedited uh, procedures that exist for uh, international review bodies to issue provisional or pre precautionary measures, rights so like a preliminary injunction or temporary restraining order in, in domestic litigation. Uh, so those could be prioritized so that countries could know in closer to real time whether their restrictions are, are permissible or not. And I think that would go a long way toward avoiding this kind of gap where states think they've done something right and only find out five, six years later that they've in fact not and they violated international law. Um, and the final question relates to scope, and that is um, thinking through uh, both the question of the relationship between ordinary exceptions and limitations. Many treaty rights are absolute, but, but the ones that to which derogations attach are not. They usually contain exceptions and limitations clauses. So what's the relationship between derogations and, and exceptions and limitations clauses? I think there's more work to be done there. And finally, to think through whether some of these treaties that have had, uh, that have expanded over time through interpretation, uh, have reached a point where maybe because they're precisely so much broader, they need their own derogations provisions. And rather than having states simply um, declare emergencies and then not even try to justify it with respect to those treaties, maybe there should be a, a derogations provision in some of these treaties 
uh, in order to deal with the kinds of emergencies that are being declared, even if they're, and that thus leading to violations of, of those agreements rather than compliance. So essentially these proposals that I've talked to you about and my, the whole structure overall really seeks to kind of open a, a, up a conversation about institutional change. And some of the reforms I propose would be very difficult. Others can be implemented in part, um, but the goal really of any institutional change ought to be to try to incentivize states participating in a system that gives them sufficient flexibility to respond to genuine crises and threats while also at the same time enhancing the informational oversight and accountability functions that derogations uh, are intended uh, to provide. And that hopefully will lead governments to minis minimize emergency rights suspensions and narrow and remove those suspensions as soon as reasonably possible. Thanks, and I look forward to your questions and, and comments. Thank you, Professor. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can't see you, Richard, but I can hear yes, you. Yes, uh, every time I turn on my video, uh, it seems that my Zoom crashes. Oh. Uh, so I, I hope- Well, it... we, can, we can do it without the, uh, we can easily do it without the, the video. Yes, yes. Uh, I've, been, I've been told that I have a face for radio, so this is <laughs> uh, just perfect for me. Um, I, so we've got a couple questions. Uh, I've got a chat. Um, one that I, uh, I think is interesting is you know, what avenues uh, could all these reforms that you've been proposed that have been proposed? Um, you know, what are the ways that they could be implemented? What are the avenues? Sure, um, sure. That for reforms in interpretation? Is it yeah, new yeah, yeah. treaties? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question, and I talk about it a little bit in the paper, and it um, it varies, right? So it varies all the way from at the one end states uh, can voluntarily um, uh, do some of this work. So for example, a state could decide, yeah, we actually think we ought to do more with the derogations uh, uh, system. And we can do that in part by, um, you know, by, by incorporating some of these recommendations into our domestic law. So it's entirely voluntarily to incorporate it. Um, and then you move up from there um, to the kinds of uh, activities by uh, international bodies that are already within their authority. So treaty depositories already give, occasionally give informal advice to governments about derogations. And they could do more than that. They could publicize the information in a more accessible uh, and, and a way, in an easily digestible way. Uh, they could um, set up a set of uh, guidelines and best practices that they could promote. They could interact with NGOs and civil society groups in ways that would alert them to the fact that a state may be going beyond what's actually uh, required. Um, so you, you can sort of see how that moves forward. I also think that the treaty bodies and, and courts themselves have some leeway to um, adopt some of these uh, reforms. So one of the things I mentioned potentially in the paper is, uh, you know, you might imagine more deference somewhat more deference being given by a tribunal to a government if it has gone through a kind of more informal a consultation process. So imagine if it started out with restricting rights to, you know, I'm just gonna pick an, a number, although we don't really think about it this way, 40% of the right to freedom of movement. But then after consultations, they, they restricted 20% of that right, right? Or somewhat less, the numbers don't really work. But, but um, that might us uh, say, oh, well, they really thought about it and, and they've narrowed it down to the, to the essence of what's needed. We're gonna give them some more deference. Um, so that also is something that can be done under existing law. Obviously, some of the reform proposals that I've uh, put forward require, would require um, amending um, some of the treaties. Now that I have mixed, very mixed feelings about because A, it's extremely difficult to do. It has been done. There are a number of these treaties have uh, protocols or supplementary uh, conventions that, that have been added to them. So it's possible, especially at the regional level. Um, but I'm always wary about that, especially in the current political climate where a number of governments are perhaps not so uh, inclined to, uh, if you do have a re review or revision opportunity uh, to, uh, actually do it in a way that would uh, make the system, international system stronger. Um, having said that, right now, this year uh, and going forward, the UN is going through uh, a process of 
reviewing all of the different treaty bodies. It's the treaty body strengthening exercise, it's called. We'll see if it actually ends up being strengthening. Um, and so um, from that perspective, you know, I, I think some of these reforms are going to already be on the table. And the question is, uh, or, or reforms that are similar are going to be on the table. Why not include these potentially as well? Um, again, I said, as I say, I have mixed feelings about that uh, precisely because I am worried about the ways in which um, governments are moving, some governments anyway, are moving away rather than toward greater compliance with human rights law. And so what I like about the set of proposals I have is um, that they really are, they, they range, right? So some could be implemented right away voluntarily. Others can be implemented in part of non-binding norms, but under existing authority. So I think there, there are a range of possibilities and that means that at least some of these reforms could be implemented uh, at relatively low cost. All right, yeah. So on the topic of declining compliance with human rights regimes, uh, we've got a question from uh, Tanner who asks, uh, the decline in global democracy has accelerated during COVID-19. Uh, do you think derogations from human rights treaties tell us anything about the future of global democracy? and whether COVID-related decline in democracy is reversible or not. I figure you're, you're definitely the man to ask. Right. Um, that's a really good question. It's a really hard question. And I wish I had a more uh, categorical um, kind of informed answer. I can tell you some of the, some of the thinking about that. Um, so the, I agree with this, the statement that uh, decline in global democracy, I mean, it's, it's something that existed prior to uh, the pandemic, but it clearly has accelerated in, in quite a few countries around the world as a result of the pandemic. What I'm not quite sure about is what that tells us uh, or what derogations or the lack of derogations tell us about that. That's uh, that decline and whether it's likely to potentially be reversible. Uh, what I can say is having studied um, derogations empirically um, in some prior work, uh, it does seem to be the case that it is a democratic governments in particular that are the ones that are most likely to use this mechanism. That is to say, to the extent that a state is worried at all about accountability uh, in whether it's domestic or international or both, and to the extent there are independent institutions, right, uh, ombudsmen, courts, especially uh, legislative oversight bodies and so forth, national human rights institutions, to the extent that those institutions are, are independent and, and have some leeway to, to operate, uh, those are the ones that are going to do the kind of accountability functions that I've mentioned. So to the extent that democracy declines globally, uh, I think derogations and the rationales for them become somewhat less um, likely to, to function in the way I've described. So I, I certainly admit to that. At the same time, I can imagine that for those countries uh, that are not fully um, moving to autocracy or military regimes, countries where there is still space for civil society or there are still opposition political parties, they're, they're just weaker and there's still an independent judicial review, but, but less so, right? There I can imagine that the government in power, which is whoops, backsliding away from democracy, might see some benefit to uh, exercising, uh, kind of getting a kind of, um, using an escape clause to say, hey, we, we, we follow the rules, right? We hear the rules that allow us to, to do this um, with the thought that that, can be an attractive option that keeps them engaged in the system rather than disengaging from it overall. Um, so I guess the, the last thing I'll say in response to that question is that I think the, the problem of, of democratic backsliding uh, is really much, much larger than the kind of the smaller issue I'm taking on here. I think it intersects with it, but I think you know, the, the rise and fall of democracies in broad terms over time is not gonna rise and fall, I think, due to the, the use or non-use of derogations. Um, rather, I think there's gonna be a much, there's a much broader set of issues uh, written about in terms of, of nationalist populism and so forth that make it 
um, much more likely that that international institutions are going to be on the receiving end of a lot of criticism, um, by the way, by democracies as well as non democracies. Um, so those are some thoughts and I realize they're not um, they're somewhat responsive and not fully responsive, but that's because it's a really big and hard question. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a very thought out yet deeply distressing answer. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's just the world we live in. All right, uh, I think we have a question from Farida. I'm gonna try and allow her to ask it um, okay. through her, her voice. Let's see if this works. All right, can, 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 can you hear me, Richard? Yes. Or yeah. Okay, awesome. Good. Amazing. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Alpha, for coming to talk to us. Um, my, I had two questions uh, originally, but I think um, you already answered um, the second, so I'll, I'll, I'll share my first. Um, I was wondering if you could um, elaborate on what the capacity problems might look like, especially considering the emergency nature. Um, so those derogations would usually occur in an emergency context. And um, the rationale is in part that domestic institutions or governments in general are already quite overwhelmed. And so how would, how would, um, how would one uh, address these issues um, in terms of to what extent can international institutions really perform that monitoring function? Um, and then, my second one, my second question um, was uh, about the incentive structure. So okay. um, you mentioned that the states who are derogating tend to be more um, in the human rights compliers camp. Um, and I was wondering if you could, I, I really, I thought it was quite fascinating how you framed derogations as kind of a carrot in the stick of human rights That's obligations. Right. That's right. And as sort of an, a way to, um, encourage states to participate in the system. And so to, yeah, I, I, I thought that ca like, to what extent do, ca do uh, states who aren't complying with human rights obligations really care about this accountability yeah. function? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll take the questions in order. Um, they're both really good questions. So on the capacity point, I wanna say two things. So first, um, there doesn't, uh, if to the extent I understand the question is, you know, states are already overburdened, they don't have a lot of capacity and you're telling them to do something else, right? Isn't that maybe not such a good idea? I don't necessarily think it requires very much um, allocation of capacity to have a state, if it's inclined to do so, uh, embed the derogations mechanism within its domestic law, right? So I could imagine for example, in the United States, uh, that there would be uh, a person, I mean, I don't think you need a, an entire office, but somebody within the uh, Human Rights, Democracy and Labor Division within the, the State Department, uh, within the Legal Advisor's Office, uh, who would, uh, would be uh, responsible for um, you know, identifying restrictions on rights that might uh, be contrary to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to which the US is a party, unless there were a derogation that, were, that was issued. Um, and so one person, right, has potentially the ability to identify the issue and depending on what procedure the state adopts, share that information with the relevant individuals. I mean, potentially that individual could be authorized to um, to suspend under some sort of delegated authority. But at, at a minimum, it could be raised with uh, whoever else in the executive branch would be making that kind of decision. I suppose it could go all the way up to the president, but it probably need not. Um, so that's one, that's one point. Um, by the way, to the extent, if you wanna think about, um, you, know, you might say, well, that's all well and good for the United States, which is a very large you know, foreign ministry or state department. What about a developing country? Turns out the most frequent derogator in the world is Peru. <laughs> that may have changed after the pandemic, but Peru derogates for this lots of things. You know, there's been a landslide in, you know, in a small village and, and they, they have to, you know, they're not able to travel or whatever. There's been an outbreak, there've been disease based ones, there've been civil unrest ones. So it's not entirely true that, um, that it, even developing countries, uh, even countries in the global south that are quite poor don't have the capacity to do this. It could be, it could be done. 
Um, the second point about your first question is, to the extent there is a capacity deficit for domestic review of emergency measures, and I think that's really true, especially in light of the last question is, there's been a decline you know, in democracy. To the extent that you already have international institutions that are have performed this function for decades and are well positioned to do that with regard to a set of principles that they have developed over the course of the, that, those decades, then essentially you kind of have a shared model in which some of the capacity is actually already there, but in, in internationally rather than domestically. And so, in a sense, you have, um, you know, you're taking some of the concerns away potentially from domestic courts that might be, or domestic review mechanisms that might be otherwise preoccupied with other things during a crisis or due to resource constraints. And that could be um, given more, uh, greater primacy to the international actors. Um, on your second question, I guess I can also kind of kind of piggyback off of the first one as well. Um, you know, you might think that, um, you know, it's generally true that the most of the, the worst human rights offenders are not frequent derogators. Um, although oddly there are pieces of their periods of time when even some of those countries do derogate. And I think there's some deep empirical work that could be done, some case studies about why that happened when it did happen. Um, but the, the derogating countries tend to range. They tend to range from you know, longstanding established democracies on the one hand to countries that are kind of in a transitional state. Now we used to say transitioning to democracy. Now, and as the previous question indicated, we might be able to also say transitioning away from democracy, right? So there's still a lot, there are many, many states for which the, the incentive rationale, the carrot and stick as you described it, which I think is right, rationale actually continues to function um, for, for the majority of, of countries, right? And so uh, to the extent there are going to be, you know, is North Korea going to uh, care about derogating from the ICCPR? No, they're not. I, I, I'm not suggesting that they are. Um, but um, there are plenty of countries where there's still enough um, independent civil society and independent governmental institutions where they might. Um, and where I could imagine, you know, in some kind of informal relationship, right, or alliance, even if you will, between the international bodies and the relevant domestic actors. So much in the way, as uh, Professor Beth Simmons and others have written about the way in which international law helps to mobilize civil society groups, especially in countries that are not incredibly repressive nor incredibly rights protective. I think that kind of idea is also true for, for derogations. So there's still a lot of space for derogations to do good, even if they can't really help with the worst offenders. Okay, I think uh, I think we have uh, time for one more question. Um, I, I suppose, yeah, and uh, one that was sent to me, um, it's that you know how how important are these formal derogations? Is is it not just box checking? Um, is this just uh, an outdated procedure? that we have, you know, especially considering uh, the majority of human rights treaties don't have it, yeah. uh, home notice function. Yeah, so that's a, that's a fair question, right? So, and I think at its worst, it can be a box checking exercise. Um, but at the same time, I think COVID has shown that uh, states uh, are taking this more seriously than, than I would have thought. I mean, the fact that you have 30 countries around the world that actually are engaging in these derogations suggests that the system is not, you know, outdated or or moribund in the same way. Um, and I suppose I proceed from the the premise that derogations are not, you know, I've been zeroing in, kind of drilling down just on derogations. But derogations are part of a much larger set of um, incentive mechanisms, flexibility tools, etc., that are part of international agreements in general, and. Uh, not just human rights treaties. So there are escape mechanisms, as they're sometimes called, in trade agreements, uh, in investment agreements. Um, there, there are a number of um, studies that have been done in the WTO, for example, on the GATT, on how these escape mechanisms work, again, during emergencies, right? There's something specific. And they actually have been shown to kind of make it such that treaties are flexible enough that they bend rather than break during 
times of tremendous political pressure. So I think still there's something really attractive about them. And my, uh, and, but one has to look at them in the context of all of these mechanisms that exist to kind of consider how much work, if you will, or how much influence they're actually having. And, and my approach, and obviously it's a hypothesis, I suppose, you know, one that could be tested you know, over time in practice, is that by making the system better, it's going to have some of the more substantial effects, positive effects that its drafters intended. And I think that it has had uh, in those instances where, where it has worked effectively. Um, and so from that perspective, rather than treating it as a kind of a dead letter or not very important, I think we need to kind of revive it. Um, in, but I, understand, I, I take the point as to why you might see this is not all that, all that interesting. The other response, I guess I would say, is that you have international bodies that are reviewing these mechanisms all the time, right? And they're among the most influential. So the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court, the Human Rights uh, Committee um, uh, in the UN, is they, the jurisprudence they produce, including, by the way, jurisprudence on emergencies and COVID and derogations, is very influential. It's influential not just for the state, relevant states' parties, but it also gets picked up by other national actors, national human rights institutions, uh, na domestic courts, national judges that refer to it. So these bodies are putting out a set of, of uh, norms and principles, sometimes in cases, sometimes in what are called general comments, sometimes in uh, comments on state party reports in, under the ICCPR. And so that normative output is still very influential, even if not all derogations are, are, um, get the same attention as say, you know, derogation during terrorism or during COVID. So from that perspective, I think the system still does have influence and um, I'd rather see it reformed than kind of treated as, as if it were in falling into desuity. All right, well, I think, uh, I think students have class at 1.15. So we're, we're cutting it a little on the, on the close side. Uh, but, but thank you for right. uh, This has been uh, you know, one of the more fascinating events we've had. Um, uh, it's a very important topic. So I think everyone is uh, applauding you. Yes, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Farida. Well, thank you for coming. I know I had some tough competition today. So uh, thanks for your attention. And um, I hope you all stay well. All right, thank you. Take Have care. Thanks, afternoon. Richard, for organizing. Uh, thank you for coming. Yep, take care. Bye-bye.